Good morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my title, as said, is the state of clinical trials in Africa. May I know how many of you is aware of clinical trials? Clinical trials. Please raise your hands. Okay, only a few people. So thinking that the majority of the audience is either from social sciences and humanities, I have included some basic slides. I'll be talking on access to medicines, as already said, a matter of human rights. Access to medicines is a matter of human rights. Like said, already said, access to science is a matter of human rights, and medicines are the products of science, therefore access not only to medicines, to quality medicines, to quality pharmaceuticals is a matter of human rights. Why do we do clinical trials? I'll talk later on. Timelines for standard drug development. How long does it take to develop a drug from a laboratory until it reaches the market? Global disease burden. The, what kind of disease burden we have globally? Globally, globally, we have a lot of uh, diseases, both communicable and non-communicable diseases. And also, we have a certain type of burden, that is accidents, injuries, and so forth. And global migration, global participation in clinical trials, and global migration of clinical trials, research on neglected tropical diseases, Barriers to conducting clinical trials in Africa. Africa increasingly attracting clinical trials, but still very low. Finally, I, have, I will have a few points as a summary. Access to medicine, access you know, to good health is a matter of human right. That is a symbol of human right adopted by the United Nations in 2013. As you can see, there are five fingers and the fingers are in such a position, okay? Such a position. And at the same time, that is also a flying bird. A flying bird is thought to be free. So that is the symbol of human rights adopted by the United Nations. So health is basic human right. It's vital for the use of other rights. It is vital for the use of other lives. If you are healthy, you can also claim your other rights, particularly the right for development. You know, to, for development, you need healthy nations, healthy young people, healthy working, healthy working for. Indispensable to have life with dignity. Okay, life with dignity and life without dignity are totally different. Life without dignity is not worth the living. That's why we should fight for our right for democracy, the right to assemble, the right to freely express your opinion, the right to write, the right to food, the right to shelter, the right to life with dignity. Access to safe, effective, and quality medicines is the main component of the right to health. So that is the background. Why clinical trials? I'll show you later on the trajectory of drug development. Clinical trials are required because we want to bring into the market safe, effective, and quality medicines. All drugs are, you can say, toxic, quote unquote, toxic. If they are not given in the right concentration because they have side effects, they have adverse effects. So in the development, we have to make sure the drugs are safe to be administered. At the same time, sometimes because of processing drugs, also because of some, some, you know, uh, some adulteration of uh, the active ingredients, the drugs that you administer may not be effective. So we must make sure that the drugs coming to market must be safe, effective, and of quality nature. That's why we need clinic, clinical trials. I'll show you what clinical trials is 
later on. And clinical trials detect, diagnose, and reduce the risk of disease. For example, in terms of vaccine, in terms of treatment. So this process, clinical trials, weighs the benefits against the risks during the clinical trials study. Uh, we start with about millions of compounds to come up with only one to two products. Millions of compounds undergo this process. First, in preclinical studies, that is test on animals, experimental animals like mice. And then we have, during the preclinical study, we have regulatory review by the regulatory body. And then we have clinical study, clinical pharmacology and safety. So this part is called discovery, and this part is called exploratory development, that is clinical phase one, clinical phase two, clinical phase three is full development. Again, we have regulatory review. And this takes from idea generation to drug coming into the market, it can take 10 to 15 years and cost us about 800 million US dollars. Just one drug. In Africa, to my knowledge, there's no single drug coming out from a laboratory, synthetic drug. We do have natural products. Why? Because it is so expensive. It is not that we do not have the knowledge in medicinal chemistry. It's not that we do not have the knowledge of processing medicines, but it is quite expensive. So the uh, African governments do not opt to produce to, to medicines, you know, this production, and instead they opt to import, import pharmaceuticals, and also produce generic medicines whose patents have expired. Produce generic medicines whose patents expired because it is quite expensive. It takes a long time, at the same time, a lot of money. Phase one is a clinical trial tested, a new drug tested only on few individuals. And phase two, and this establishes safety, and phase two establishes safety and efficacy. Phase three, a larger population, global, including you know, gender, various ages, and also ethnic groups. And finally, you start with millions of compounds, and you have only one or two products to market. That's why this is monopolized by multinational companies, mainly in the United States of America, North America, Europe, nowadays China, India, and also Japan. So it's mainly a, 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 an enterprise of like 20 to 30 multinational companies. The global disease burden. Again, you can see the burden, the disease burden. This is South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Middle East, North Africa, Caribbean, Latin America, only on the top. These are countries that produce 90% of the medicine, but they are only 10% of the population. Here we have 90% of the population and no production of, you know, new drugs. Only we produce generic medicines. Again, resource. What matters is the resource. Why? Because this requires infrastructure, the state of lab, you know, to produce, and also highly skilled scientists. And we do not have this in Africa yet. We are training and also trying to build infrastructure. It's a matter of time, but we are trying to catch up with the rest of the world. Like, for example, India, China are catching up with the rest of the developed countries. Nowadays, India is number one raw material producing as far as active ingredients are concerned, and they export to, to Europe and North America. This is in terms of the cause of disease burden. Cardiovascular diseases are now number one killer, both in developed countries and in developing countries. Then comes cancer. Cancer is more affecting the developing countries, low-income countries, and middle-income countries than the developed countries. In the past, it was affecting the developed countries. But the developed countries, they are not only developing economically, they are developing scientifically, and also lifestyle and awareness. They are aware of the lifestyle that cause cancer. Because of that, the, in the next 
after two or three slides, I will show you the disease burden in Africa. Non-communicable diseases. This is the disease burden, global disease burden of non-communicable diseases. That is a disease not transferred to any other person. For example, if I have cancer, I will not tra transfer that cancer. If I have asthma, I will not transfer that cancer. If I'm diabetic, okay, I will not transfer. These are called non-communicable diseases. These are becoming, again, serious problems for Africa. Cardiovascular disease, and these are you know, increasing the non-communicable diseases. Africa, we call the dual burden disease. Communicable diseases, HIV, TB, malaria, diarrhea, and so on. And the non-communicable diseases, cancer, cardiovascular, we call this the double or the dual burden of disease. Still we have a triple, a third one, malnutrition, accident, road accident, injuries. These are, again, other rising problems we have. And sometimes we call Africa as a triple burden. And then, having realized the rampant, rampant prevalence of HIV, tuberculosis, the European Union thought that we should help Africa. So European came with a proposal, European Union, working together with developing countries to develop the capacity of clinical trials in Africa. So collaborative clinical research between 15 European countries and 30 sub-Saharan African countries. The reason, reduce the individual, social, and economic burden of poverty-related infectious diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. All infectious diseases are related to poverty. To enhance research capacity, in research capacity in clinical research, and also clinical trials. Clinical trials is different than clinical research. Clinical research is the basic research. What is, for example, the causative agent of tuberculosis, that is clinical research. What kind of tuberculosis we have? That is basic research or clinical research. Clinical trials is trying the drug, whether it works or not. So, and accelerate the development of new or improved medical intervention for the identification, treatment, and prevention of poverty-related infectious diseases. Now, we are also working together on communicable diseases. The number of African countries participating in this scheme is also increasing. Global participation of clinical trials, Food and Drug Administration, 2015-16 report. That is America, United States of America. We have 31% of the clinical trials undertaken in America. The rest of the world is 69%. This justifies over, you know, significant percentage of these multinational companies are based in America. And in terms of population, in terms of population, America is only 40%. The rest of the world is 96%. So this shows you development, you know, the economy you have is the governing, the governing, uh, the, govern, uh, the, um, gov the governance, your capacity to develop new medicines and also to conduct the clinical trials. Global migration of clinical trials. Slowly, 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 uh, the multinational companies are approaching developing countries. Because one, capacity for undertaking clinical trials is in place, being in place, good clinical practice, good laboratory practice, and so forth. Secondly, secondly there are also local manufacturing companies increasing, either Locally, locally uh, owned by the local government or local investor or at the joint venture. So local production is slowly increasing. For example, in Ethiopia, we cover only like 20% of the local demand from local production. The rest, 80% is imported. Although today we have like 15 pharmaceutical manufacturing companies. Barriers for conducting clinical trials in Africa. One, as I said, number one is lack of funding. Lack of funding. Goes with, without saying, lack of funding. 
lack of human resources, skilled human resources, who can conduct the clinical trials, also monitor the clinical trials. And lack of policy makers undertaking and understanding, understanding what clinical trials is. So human resources fund, these are the major stumbling block for, uh, uh, for uh, against the development of uh, clinical trials. And the lack of infrastructure is also there. This was done in 2012 when we had the European Union collaboration with South Sub Saharan Africa. Like in 2017, in 2018, there was a survey undertaken, and the barriers include lack of human resources is still there, lack of infrastructure is still there, lack of funding, ethical and regulatory system obstacles, operational barriers, and competing demands. Because we are poor, there are other competing demands. If you are in a government place, you have so many competitive demands, and you opt you know, for example, food security first, and then clinical trials, so forth. Africa increasingly attracting clinical trials. What are the reasons? High level of disease burden, both non-communicable, communicable diseases, and other types of diseases, including neglected diseases. Limited access, oops, limited, limited access to health care. Because we have limited access to healthcare, out there there are a number of volunteers thinking that they will get that healthcare, volunteer to participate in clinical trials. And then epidemiological transition. We are transiting from non-communicable diseases, from communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. Fast growing population, I will show you later on. Rapid economic growth and also a rising middle class. These are the facts, some of the factors that attract international organizations to come to Africa and the developing countries to conduct clinical trials. World population. In 1990, we were 5.3. In 2015, we became 7.3 billion. In 2030, we will be 8.5 billion. In 2050, 9.7 billion. At the turn of the century, we will be 11.2 billion. This is these are just the numbers increasing. But the most important thing I want to show is Africa's share. In 2015, African share is only 16% of the world. In 2030, it will be 20% of the global population. In 2063, it will be 30% of the world population. One third of the world population will be Africans. In 2063 and in 20. In 2100, you can extrapolate that. If that goes on, maybe we become half of the world population. That is not good for Africa. Unless this is accompanied by what we call population dividend. Unless the growth is accompanied by economic growth, that will be disaster not only for Africa, but for the whole world. So clinical trials in Africa, my concern is that Case studies in some African countries indicate no unified legislation on clinical trials. Lack of capacity to monitor clinical trials. Institutions involved in clinical trials are underfunded and there is no public scrutiny. Easy to get treatment, naive people. These are people who never had any medication. So they simply volunteer for clinical trials. These are naive people for treatment because the healthcare system is very poor and very low and they can be exploited because there is no public scrutiny. And development in clinical trials regulation. This is a positive aspect. The African Vaccine Regulatory Forum, a network of national regulatory authorities, NRS, and the National Ethics Committee, ECS was established in Africa in 2006 by the World Health Organization. However, the assessment showed that there is no harmonization because the national research authorities 
regulatory authorities are at different maturity levels at African level. So the mandate is given to this organization and they have now harmonized the regulation to regulate clinical trials in Africa. In summary, access to medicine is a matter of human right and we should work toward this that. Drug development is time taking and quite expensive. Nonetheless, we should, this, we should put this in our longer term strategic plan that we should start developing, allocate some budget to develop in the longer term active pharmaceutical ingredients so that we become self-sufficient at least in diseases that are affecting African population. So local producti production of quality pharmaceutical should be strengthened. This is in the strategic plan of the African Union as well as we have adopted, Ethiopia has adopted this, this strategy. I myself was involved in the preparation of the strategy and nowadays we have like 14 pharmaceutical uh, companies in Ethiopia producing essential medicine. So we are on the, the, first, the first country in Africa to adopt the African Union strategy for local production of pharmaceuticals. And for the first time, the World Health Organization helped the country, us, to come up with this pharmaceutical production strategy in Ethiopia as a model country. Clinical research in Africa should receive due attention. Clinical research, we need to research. To develop clinical trials, research comes first. And Africa is increasingly attracting the global pharmaceutical industry and the right regulation should be in place when clinical trials are introduced to various parts of Africa. Africa should develop capacity in clinical trials, harmonize clinical trials, protocols, guidelines, and procedures should be in place. Should be in place in action, monitored, implemented, and I thank you very much for your attention. Am I on time? Thank you so much, Professor, for a very clear and comprehensive not only explanation but also set of recommendations that we will take uh, to heart and, and include in the next events both in Africa and in Europe. Anagav Atikem, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Zoological Sciences at Addis Ababa University, uh, once he has connected his computer, will be speaking about Build Science in Africa, Opportunities and Challenges. We should Yes, there you go. The, the pointer, you need it? The also, we are videotaping this debate and we will ben then post it on the website of the, uh, the YouTube channel of both the Associazione Luca Cusconi and Science for Democracy and we'll share it on our Facebook page. If you want to follow us, it's on Facebook and it's of course called Science for Democracy. There you go. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll present some of the most important findings in our recently published paper in Nature. It's a uh, title is Building Science in Africa and the Opportunities and Challenges in the Process of Building Science in Africa. So science and technology is one of the most important factors in any kind of development. If you take any kind of sector, whether it's an agriculture, education, health, transportation, and any kind of social sciences, advancement of sciences is key for the development. Okay. But Science for Africa is not about the development only. It is a question of survival. In our paper, we predict that with the current trend, Africa cannot sustain, even with the current poverty. It means that the poverty will be even worse in the next 60 years. This is because of several reasons, but some of the most important reasons are the human population growth, and the climate change. The African population, it has been 200 million during uh, 1950, but it increased like 1.25 billion only in the, in the last 70 years. 
this is a very large increase when you compare it to other parts of the world. If you see just China, which the population is growing very quick next to Africa, the increase is only 3.6. And the EU countries, the 28 member countries, the population don't really increase, it's only 1.75. So they are almost the same population for the last 70 years. And the United States population is double. But this is not because of the birth rate, mainly it's because of the immigration. There's, a, there's lots of immigration to the United States. And it's not only just the population increase, but the development is very, very slow. And this creates uh, unsustainable natural resources. As you know, in African countries, the larger population is dependent on uh, agricultural activities. It is, can be crop riding or livestock. And as the population increases, just the land is degrading. And it will be more smaller and smaller area for agriculture and smaller and smaller area for grazing land. And it cannot be continued, just the land cannot sustain any kind of growth uh, in the next 50, 60 years. And because of the slow economic development, there is a very high unemployment rate. In Africa, the unemployment rate exceeds like 30%. And China, the population is like 3.6 times in the last 70 years. But you can see that they have very uh, small uh, percentage of unemployment rate because even if their population increases they have economic development so there is more job for the young people and all these things lead to low income in Africa just this 2541 is just for the whole Africans some Africans are very rich but if you go to like the sub-Saharan Africa countries including Ethiopia just the income is very very low I think the Ethiopian is like 600 uh, dollars so it's quite, quite small. These things create poverty. Um, and on top of these very complicated problems, Africa faces a new threat, the climate change. The climate change, it has several uh, impacts. But if we mention only very few, one is just the change in weather. It creates flood in one area, and it, creates, it causes a drought in another area. And this affects the entire ecosystem. It affects the agriculture. Uh, it affects the water supply. In the dry area, there is no water. And in the flooded area, just the whole water supplies and the infrastructures will be damaged. And th this will have consequence on the health. And uh, it also have um, impacts on, on health, like in communicable diseases and stuff. And the climate change also uh, caused lots of displacement in Africa. Since 2008, an average of 21.8 million people is estimated to be displaced due to the effects of climate change. And if the change of the climate change continues in the same pattern, and if the African economy and the mitigation techniques continue in a similar pattern. It's estimated that 1.6 billion people will be displaced by 2060. And this displacement will create a huge disaster. Because as humans are displaced, it will cause like uh, national and international insecurity. So there will be a lot of uh, compl complicated problems. And for countries located in the sea level, that is increase in water uh, level, so that's uh, uh, one big challenge. In the, in the current situation, Africa is very vulnerable uh, continent for the climate change because just we have less money uh, to involve, we have less technology, and more importantly, our production system, whether it's an agriculture or it's a livestock husbandry, it is totally depend on nature. We don't have any kind of technical energy and science involved in our uh, production systems. So what should be done? That's the main question. To mitigate climate change and to reverse the trends of this poverty, we need three important things. The knowledge and skill, technology, and wealth. These three things are very much interrelated. If you have like the knowledge and the skill, you'll have the technology. And if you have the technology, where will come? 
these have been proved in, in China. That in China, just there were lots of immigration from very developed countries to China. They bring skills, knowledge, and their skills and knowledge, they, it, it comes to be technology. And just they can produce lots of goods with cheap materials, and they can they, they manage to increase their economy. So Africa is a very strong research center and universities. In the current status, the African universities are in a very low standard when compared to the world. If you take the world rank, one up to like one up to nine ranked universities in Africa are in South Africa. So in 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 some way, just some people think that just South Africa is not real Africa. And if you count like other universities, like if you take University of Nairobi, it is tens in Africa, but it is 987 in the world rank. And if you take Addis Ababa University, it is 19 in um, in, in Africa, but if you take the world standard, it is 1,340. So the research and the diversity standard in Africa are still at a very low standard. And we can mention several reasons for this. As you know, there is a tremendous uh, achievement in expanding higher education in Ethiopia and also just in other African countries. It is the same trend. Just the number of universities are increasing very quick. The Ethiopian universities, like before 2000, it has been like five, but now we have over 46 universities. Regardless of this, however, just the universities have very poor laboratory facilities, and there is lack of funding for um, training and research. If you take the case of Addis Ababa University, I, I don't know the case in the social science, but in our case, I'm at the biology department. The, a PhD student will receive like $3,000. So this is a very small amount of money. It can be enough for a master's student so that he can learn how to do science. But as a PhD student, to do some important science and take science one step ahead, this is a very uh, insufficient money. And the faculty members are typically poorly paid uh, and insufficiently trained. If you take like the percentage of PhDs in Ethiopia, it is like 6%. And if you, even in South Africa, which is considered to be the most advanced country uh, in Africa, the PhD holders in the university is only just 79%. And the other is just the publication. It has been mentioned uh, previously. So in, if you take, like in, in, in many of the African countries, the publications for the case of promotion and other purpose, it is considered for uh, it's like a reputable journal, or it's like a journal that lasts like for five years. But in international standard, there is a standard called ISI, so every journal have its own uh, standard. Like nature is like 40 and science is 29, so it will be continued like that. And if you count the percentage of contributions of Africa in this ISI journals, it's almost nil. And if you take at least one author from African universities, it counts only just 2.6%. Um, and China takes 18.6, and the United States 17.8, and the EU countries, they contributed 26.7. So the quality of science is measured in ISA impact factor. And in most of the African universities, they publish in, in kind of low rank journals. We call, they, they, we call it like reputable journals, but they are not really in this ISI impact factor journal. And the other problem, which everyone familiar with, is the brain drain. Africa spends like billions and billions of money to train the young people. When one reaches like four years at the university, it could be like lots and lots of money uh, spent on that person. And finally, when one went to like Europe or America, they'll not get back. So that, that's a, a very huge problem. First, Africa lose money because it is money spent on, on bringing him to the university. And then in the university, he gets lots of knowledge and training. And if he don't get back, then the purpose of sending him to Europe and America don't work. So 
So these are, I think, the most important uh, problems. And the international community uh, have tried to, to contribute for the development of science and education. As you know, I'm sure you know just um, the World Bank projects. They spend like $500 million uh, divided for 46 countries only since 2014. And there are lots of other projects which you may be familiar with this SIDA, uh, the NORAD, and the, the USAID, JIZ and the Italian Development Corporation. They spend lots of money. And there are also several scholarship programs. But still, the, uh, the targeted achievements, the, the goal is not really um, fulfilled. So the conclusion is Africa is not poor, but it's a poorly managed country, continent, I mean. There is a very huge resources and there is hope for the development but Africa needs science and technology and Africa needs homegrown researchers and as I said just having science is not the question of development for Africa but it is a question of survival so the policymakers and the government should do all their best to attract and retain uh, highly qualified scientists in the university, and the overall support or the international support should be very much coordinated and it should be sustained. One thing which we argued in our publication is just funding from international funding should be uh, somehow uh, sustained for a so long time. Like the World Bank, for example, they gave the funding only for the five years. And to bring a change in within five years in a given department is just too short. So it is much better to expand the time, like the duration of the funding, like 20 years, even compromising the amount of money uh, donated to so the universities. So this is all what I have. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. If uh, there are questions, now is the time. Anybody? I have two questions. First one, you mentioned a couple of times the publication. You have to say where the, arti the article that you're talking about, please. On the article types? Yeah, OK, yes. So um, if you go to the Google, there is kind of international standard for journals. And for a journal to, to have ISI impact factor, then it should have there are several criteria, but one of the criteria is it should be cited. For example, here we can argue, we can um, argue to have one uh, new uh, paper, and we can start publication. But then, to be the ISI impact factor, then we have to be able to get lots of good research products, and that research have to be cited by another researcher. For example, if you take Senex, we have uh, a journal called Senex at Addis Ababa University. I wonder if this is uh, also for social science or also for uh, natural science. But this journal have been here for many years, for example, but still it is not in the ISI impact factor journal. The reason is just the publications that are not cited by other and other international journals. So if you have a journal, for example, if I get something very critical, something new, I will submit to Nature. So I'll get like 40 points. And like in our stream, in the ecology and landscape genetics, there is a journal in Africa called African Journal of Ecology, which is a very good one. It has 0 0.6 impact factor. So it is, so it is like in, in grading, they have um, a different, a different uh, roles and different values. But if you have like um, a CV and send it to Europe, that is the first thing they will make. Just they will see your CV and they will read your publications and they will see which particular journal you publish. If you publish it in like in journal in ISI Impact Factor, then they can give it a grade. If it is not in the ISI Impact Factor journal, then that's all. You will not get much credit. Am I clear? I'm not sure. 
Yeah. Yes. It is. There are different systems. I had a pr uh, question for you, Professor. You mentioned that Ethiopia is the first one to have established these guidelines to produce locally medicines. Have they also started producing, or is it just the guidelines? And what are the medicines? It is not guideline. It's a strategy. Strategy for uh, uh, capacitating local production of essential medicines. Because you need medicines in times of crisis, natural calamity, and also medicines specific to your local community. So every nation should be self-sufficient, like it should be self-sufficient in terms of food security. It has to be also self-sufficient in the production of essential life-saving medicines. So the African Union came that we need to encourage each nation to produce essential medicines. Essential medicines because one, is capacity building and pharmaceuticals also enhance the development of science. When there is no local capacity in the production, they must seek for joint venture or uh, what, what you call direct for in foreign investment. So there are direct foreign investment now taking place in Ethiopia and also joint ventures. And most of them are successful when they are joint venture and also direct foreign investment. Local capacity is not there for local investor because investment in pharmaceutical industry is very, very expensive. So what we did was, what we did was we put, you know, this uh, investment uh, policy to attract uh, foreign investors and they are coming for a number of reasons because potentially Ethiopia is now 110 million. This is a potential economy provided that we are growing with, because we aspire to be a middle-income country in just five years from now. And there is an increase, an increase in uh, per capita. It's not $600 now, it is increasing. The other thing I would like to comment, if I get this opportunity, for me, it is not the foreign support that matters. Change should come within Africa. Of course, international partnership is very important. International. But we need to be smart. Whenever we want to attract you know, our partners, it should be mutual. For sustainable development, it should benefit both parties. For example, what are our needs in this country? For example, archaeology, we can attract our partners in Europe, in America. Anthropology, we can attract uh, because we, have, we are a, a nation of multicultural. Climate change, we can attract, provided, provided we have good proposal to attract scientists from north. So north-south collaboration should be based on strengths, not on weakness. Because this support has been there for the last 50, 60 years. Did it change? No. So there must be a new strategy where Africa should be really conscious, smart, to attract based on its niche, based on its comparative advantage. I could mention a number of areas where we have comparative advantage. Tropical diseases. Europeans do not have tropical diseases, but they have curiosity to know what kind of tropical disease is there. What does, the, for example, the Ebola, Ebola virus? This attracts this international because man has curiosity by nature. So tropical disease, and you know, some of them they learn only in theory, whether it is in North America. So although Having this burden, disease burden, is bad for Africa, but as Einstein said, in the middle of difficulties, there lie opportunities. So we need to convert these difficulties and challenges into opportunities to attract our brothers and sisters in the north to come to south, work together, they benefit from this endeavor. So we, it's time for Africa to, you know, to stand on its two, two feet and also show the rest of the world. Because as my colleague said, Africa is poor because of mismanagement, because of lack of democracy. If you do not have democracy, you will not have free mind to think. Otherwise, in every child I believe, in every child I believe, there is scientist. Every child is a potential genius. If we give these children quality education.
Sorry for taking that. Thank you very much, and thank you both of you. We move to the next session, which is Regional Human Rights Mechanism, What Attention for Science. I invite Elena Abrushi, who's the Senior Researcher of the Human Rights Big Data and Technology Project at the Human Rights Center of the University of Essex, and also uh, Mezenbet Tadeg, who's PhD Assistant Professor of Law at the Sabeba University School of Law, Partner Sky and Associate Law Officer, and Giulia Perrone, who is PhD candidate at the University of Turin Law Department, who, who is also research and advocacy officer of the Associazione Luca Coscioni in Science for Democracy, and also she was very important in putting together today's program.